Okay, so I, John and Justin, I think you guys know each other from FDFA probably. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis, I have not actually met Lewis before. I have met Ibrahim Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Ibrahim his, his business partner, I guess, I'm not sure, business colleague anyway. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of introduction for all of you. Justin owns a, a border store between Canada and US and correct me if I'm wrong with anything, Justin. Um, I've known Justin for a number of years now and he does have a specialty, which you'll see in one of the questions of um, providing higher end spirits to people from New York who drive up specifically for that, for my understanding from speaking to you before. So that's his spirits. And I, I imagine you have pretty good, strong category sales as well. Well, when you're, when, when things are in the normal circumstances. When the traffic is flowing, yeah. Yeah. Um, Lewis is with Portland Design based in London. And uh, Lewis, I'm, I am of the understanding that you have worked on a number of Johnny Walker houses and maybe the lead design for a number of those or the lead in a number of those. I know you've worked in the spirits category for design purposes with retail. Is yes. that correct? Correct. Yes. <clears throat> and John is... Uh, he's pro I, I say he's the reason everybody in the world knows Tito's. <laughs> That's kind John of has brought Tito's from being a little brand in, in a small city in Texas to being renowned the world over. So that's who you all are. And uh, let's just get to the questions. So this is one question that um, continually comes up because people are always trying to break into duty free. Duty free is, is uh, a channel that helps any brand in any category become better known throughout the world. And that's one of the reasons it can be. It can be a profit maker for some companies. It can be a loss leader for some companies, but, but the point is to bring new brands out, I would say a lot of the time. Smaller brands have a really hard time breaking in to that channel. And now given the circumstances these days, uh, most retailers are dropping SKUs as opposed to picking them up. So I wonder what you guys think is the place for smaller brands. And I'm going to start with John, I think, because John, your brand started as a smaller one. I don't know if it's still considered one now, but you, you actually uh, braved those waters to begin with. So wh what do you think about this? Um, what I think is, and this is not directed at Justin or anybody along the border shops, this is more about airport operators that they need to um, be cognizant of s small craft brands and what they bring to the party. And what I mean by that is they can't, they need to change their model because it's very, very expensive, as you pointed out, Wendy, to enter that channel. And it's coming to the point where I'm, I'm back and forth whether or not to stay in duty-free airports because of the cost of doing business. And um, so <clears throat> they're not gonna, the customers want brands that they can't necessarily get in the domestic markets. So a brand that comes to mind is like Whistle Pig Rye, which is out of Vermont. You know, that's a very small brand, but has a great following and people should be able to find that in some duty-free outlets. Uh, another operator that, that's doing a great job, I think, is International Shops out of Boston and New York. They bring in craft brands that are specific to that city. So I'm based in Boston, and they have brands from Boston Harbor Distillery, Bully Boy Distillery. It's, so they have a section of their store that's dedicated to Boston craft brands. And I'll okay. let somebody else talk. Justin, maybe we'll go to you with that question because you are one of those retailers along the border and you probably know that brand being right by Vermont. Yeah, I think uh, John's answer is, is, is excellent actually because the way that I always understood it with, with airport duty-free was that it, 
generally the larger companies that are running airports are based on global buying. So they'll more or less choose the brands that they want for a variety of locations rather than the local market. Uh, with the land border, we're perhaps a little bit more flexible to try things because we don't have a large multinational company behind us. We're all family owned and operated. Um, also, I think if it's a, a new brand coming into the market, the way that I understand it is that if, you know, if the brand gets picked up by a larger representative like Diageo or Perno Ricard, there'll be a lot of marketing in order to, you know, to flush the market, get it into the market that way. But if they're not picked up that way, perhaps the best way to start is actually with uh, the local market uh, and really concentrating on your strengths and building up from there. Uh, I'm not sure if John agrees with that, but that, that to me sounds like it would make a lot of sense is concentrating on what you know and then growing it from there. I did speak at one time with the liquor buyer for, I think it was the liquor buyer, some buyer for, for do free who said really what you've got to do is establish yourself at the local store, get the, the get the local manager to ha get you in, prove yourself that way. And then you can expand. It's very similar to our liquor boards. For example, uh, the liquor boards will carry um, regular inventory. Then they'll carry specialty product. A lot of the specialty product or, or things that we order on our own are, are, smaller brands that are not necessarily in the, in, in the mainstream uh, of, of, of SKUs. And once they've been able to reach a certain threshold, they get into the mainstream. So it's very similar as well with the liquor boards, but you do have to concentrate on, on your strengths to begin. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Lewis, I, that's not really your area. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Oh gosh, tons, absolutely tons. I do, broadly, uh, t totally agree. John, but John's point is excellent. I think that the, um, well, well, all the points are good. I think we take the, reason is that we take the customer side in this and if you look at feedback in customer surveys about people's attitude towards duty free yeah, excuse me for just one second lewis by customer you're talking about the consumer the, yeah the, the past the traveling passenger or the person who might visit a duty free store who might not duty visit a duty free store so if you, if you if you look at customer surveys of those folks uh, a lot of them say they, they don't really engage with duty-free stores because it's boring, because it's the same old, same old. So I think local brands and niche brands have a key role to play in, in as John says, in, they're different. They're, they're not available in your local market. They've got a new story, a new experience uh, to tell. So I think that uh, airports need to understand that they can drive footfall uh, to their retail propositions if they've got a healthy balance between the unfamiliar, the new, the exciting, and the familiar, the stuff that people expect to see. So that balance, I think, isn't quite right at the moment. People aren't seeing enough of the new stuff the, or the, they don't expect to see a lot of new and different stuff. They, they rather expect to see the opposite. They expect to see the same old, same old. And that's, that's a problem for all of us. Yes, and that is a problem that is continually being expressed when people are being interviewed. Uh, we, we often, um, write uh, write articles based on research done by mindset. I'm sure you guys have seen some with Peter Moan. Yes. And that's a very, very common expression from consumers is that they're bored with what's there. And uh, so I wonder, I wonder really what you think the retailers should be doing as far as something like this goes. How, how are they, how, when they know that they can sell X number of bottles of Johnny Walker and X number of bottles of, you know, whatever Smirnoff. Why are they, why would they take a chance on something that's a little different? How do they know, how do they balance the, the risk versus the reward? Oh, that's for you, Lewis. Well, I, uh, a very good question. And this is, this is one that's just vexing everybody at the moment. I think you have to look at the numbers, don't you? I think that there's a, pre-pandemic, pre, pre there was a sense that um, sales were declining. So if you like, the conversion rate was in, the conversion rate was in decline versus footfall, uh, which, you know, there's that, that, there's that that's a well-known fact and it's a well, a well sort of explored idea. So I think if you take the idea that behind that lies the truth that is people are bored of the offer, uh, I think we can say that rows and rows of bottles on shelves are not what people are interested in. So we've got lots of learnings from different markets and different things, from domestic markets, from travel retail markets around, say, uh, experience design you know, introducing people to the brand, not necessarily being interested in always selling something. Um, you could be selling the brand, the brand story. You could be interested in acquiring the customer. And I think, uh, as John said, that, you know, the, the, the metrics around customer acquisition are different to the metrics around um, transaction. So I think airports need to get ahead around um, the idea that actually 
they could get customers, uh, the consumer engaged with the retail propositions and the F&B propositions if they aren't always insisting on the same revenue per square foot uh, in the same old metrics as before. So I think one of the fundamental things that has to change, and, and it's a really tough thing for everyone to get their head around, is the metrics of revenue have to change. Otherwise, we will continue to look at declining transactions volumes and uh, reductions in footfall, reductions in dwell time, basically the retail propositions are becoming less and less interesting to, to the majority of people. There'll always be a hardcore cohort of folks who are looking for a good deal. And if you've got enough of those people uh, in your airport, then you may decide to sort of continue just selling to those people. But I think for the majority, for, for an increasingly uh, larger number of people, uh, they're not interested in the price because they get a good price through lots of other channels in lots of other areas. So they're looking for something else beyond value. The added value kind of conversation starts right there. Okay, do uh, John or Justin have anything to add to that? I think Lewis is spot on about the revenue metric. You know, let's face it, the gap between duty-free pricing and the domestic price is is narrowing because of the big box stores. So people, the consumer that's going into duty-free wants something that's different, better, and special than they can get in the domestic market. And, and the price really comes down. Uh, they're, they're very cognizant of price. Uh, I, from a land border perspective, that's one of the most important things for anyone coming into the store. Not just on alcohol, but also on um, our stock levels, if there's another product missing in beauty, for example, something that they came in the store for, they won't buy anything else. So we also have to be stocked up on all the other categories as well. That's very important. Okay, I'm gonna skip over question two for now and go right to question three, because Lewis, you brought up the quote that, I, that I'm quoting there by Ibrahim. Ibrahim, I always say Ibrahim. <laughs> Ibrahim, um, that there's, I, he said, there's a better way to sell spirits than rows and rows of bottles on shelves. And then he said, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that is the best way. That's not what I think is the best way. Obviously activations and tastings are helpful, but is there a better way than rows and rows and bottles of, of bottle, bottles on shelves for sales? Well, I, th I think so. Yeah, I think um, you have to obviously respect the fact that there are different types of shopper on different, what we call missions. So some, are interested in locating their favorite bottle of vodka quickly and they just want to get in and get out and that's a what we call a locate mission so there'll always be you know that kind of a shopper around but then there are lots of other shoppers around who are interested they might be interested in vodka but they might be interested in trying a new vodka or uh, like back to the local brand or a niche brand kind of product idea so i think then the question becomes well how do you sell to that type of person who's looking who, who, who knows what they don't want, but not, doesn't know exactly what they do want. And that's, I think, is where you move away from stuff on shelves, because that's for people who know what they want. So I think, yeah, I think the, the experiential part comes into it. I think the, I mean, we can't just break down the customer journey into, I am in a shop standing in front of a wall bay or standing at a gondola. I think the customer journey is now bigger. So I think that, you know, the question of how to sell is like that moment in front of a wall bay or talking to a sales associate or standing in the category has to be fantastic, of course. Course. but I think there's the whole sort of 360 degree piece around how does how do you promote that um, brand or your brand or uh, your product to that person before they even step into the store before they get to the airport and so on so that be, that becomes part of it look, looking at the whole the whole mission but I think uh, basically if we're going to focus on the store experience I think a total rethink around what happens at the moment that I'm in a shop I'm experiencing the emotion of being interested in brands or products or, or categories. Um, but I just don't want to be staring at stuff on a shelf with no story, no engagement, nobody talking to me about it. Just somebody trying to sell me something based on price. I think there'll always be price conscious customers, but I think uh, there's a lot of people who are looking, to, uh, as John says, that's something extra special, you know, uh, and we need to be thinking about what, what is that specialness. And I think I'd like to go to you, John, now with that question, because you you broke beyond all those barriers. You were not allowed to put your bottle on shelf and you you created an environment where people are looking for your product. So what do you have to say about that? Well, Wendy, I'm gonna answer question three and four together okay. because I think this is where the duty-free operators have failed miserably and that's in e-commerce. And if if we learned anything during the last 18 months is people want home delivery. So I liken it to why can I get off of an airplane 
around the globe, click on an Uber app, and I can order an Uber to pick me up at that airport in the local currency with just the tap of my finger. But yet, when we go to duty free, each operator has their own website. But the consumer doesn't understand that there's this player is, is a duty free operator and that player. Why don't we have one application that or platform that all the duty free operators are on so that when you order your ticket, Right away, you get an email saying, hey, when you come to New York City Kennedy Airport, please visit your duty-free shop. And here's the exclusive items we have, or here's a, a coupon for a discount, or come in because we're tasting Johnny Walker today. It, it, it boggles my mind that we, between all of us, we haven't cracked the code on this. So I'm working with a a group of guys that have engaged with travelx.ai and they in, they empower travel retail partners to increase sales and passenger engagement it's a digital retail marketplace where you can see the inventory you can order food on it uh, it has a chatbot 24 7 personalized offers it's in all the local currencies and it's great for brand owners because you can run campaigns on it and get analytics back. So um, I'm hoping that TFWA, FDFA, IAADFS, MEDFA, all these organizations come together and find us a platform that we should all adopt. And well, I, I don't buy the excuse about, you know, oh, they, the duty for your operators, you know, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, oh, you know, you're going to compare prices. That that ship sailed a long time ago. Anybody can Google anything and check the price. Well, I do. I, I want to say a couple of things. I'm going to get to you in a, just a second, Justin. One thing is, you, I've, I think you're bang on. I've had a, this discussion with many people how Do Free has its has its um, branding and. DFA has its branding and all the different retailers have their branding and, and the customers, that means absolutely nothing to the consumer. They don't know. They don't know who the duty-free store is when they're landing in, in uh, Mazatlan. They don't, they don't, they, they do not have any understanding of that. So unless they're fully engaged travelers, which you maybe might find in Brazil do free because that's pretty much all that's there. But unless you have uh, a, a really fully engaged traveler who's there often and, and, and knows the store well, that because that traveler is not going to know which website to go on. So I take your point, definitely. I think that's a great idea. And I'm going to bring Justin into that because this is actually something that FDFA started a couple of years ago and said, you guys, each, all, each of the border stores has your own branding, but we want to have a branding which you have adopted, I see, on your store. Everybody hasn't, or everybody hadn't the last time I looked, to keep it, it standard across the duty-free stores because, again, nobody knows that you're the owner of the, that duty-free store and, and somebody else is the owner of another duty-free store. But I'm also going to bring in that Justin being in Canada is can't sell anything any liquor digitally so he's he's out of that picture but anyway what, what what do you have to say about that justin well i can even bring that a step further so in the omni-channel environment what, what we're doing obviously is we try to do some geofencing with facebook instagram so that we target them on the highway but even worse than that one of the biggest problems that i have in my store is that the customers don't even know that they can stop they don't even know that duty free is for them that is really the biggest problem that we have when you're walking through an airport a lot of the time you're forced through a duty free and you kind of get the feeling for it all right but if you're on the highway and you don't know what duty free is which is the majority of the customers or the majority of the passengers on the highway how do you pull them in the store and believe it or not one of the most effective marketing tools that we have to get people in the store is a highway sign it's it's not even the mobile device we actually opened a starbucks coffee in our store to really make people feel comfortable with stopping. Oh, I can stop at a Starbucks, I can go in there. But they don't necessarily know how a duty-free works. So if I could overcome that in some way, and yes, the Canadian stores, you know, we, we've changed our marketing, we all have the same logo, more or less. Um, but really my problem is how do I get people to stop off of the highway? And not only that, but when you're, when you're shopping duty-free at a Canadian border store and you're on your way to New York City, for example, and you come and see me, 
most of the um, allowances are on 48 hours, but you are still allowed to buy things after 24 hours. And there are still dollar amounts that you can spend, but no one understands how this works. So once they're in there, we try to educate them as best we can. But again, is how do we actually make them pull in the parking lot? That's, that's the greatest challenge that we have. That's a brilliant idea, putting a Starbucks in the store. <laughs> because yeah. I know that I can go to a Starbucks. Right. I'm used to, right? And, and, and that's, that's what pulls them off the highway. But what else can we do other than a road sign, maybe some geofencing if someone's going through their Instagram, you know, in the backseat of the car, uh, how, how do we pull them in? That's a very, very challenging thing. You, there's a, there's a, a chain of banks down here. I don't know if you have them in Canada, Capital Bank. And, you know, over the years, bankers have conditioned us to do all our transactions through the ATM or online, go paperless. And then they, then they had the uh-oh moment. Oh my God, I don't know any of my customers. So this bank has installed coffee shops in all their banks to yeah. get people to come in and hang out and then they sell them. And, and believe it or not, some of the motor coach traffic, the, the biggest draw that I have for a lot of the motor coach traffic, other than pricing and the products and everything is we've got, we've got clean bathrooms and we're open 24 hours a day and it's your stop right before you go into the United States. Oh, they've got bathrooms there. Well, we're going to stop. <laughs> so it could be something that you don't even normally think about in the land border. It's quite different, but uh, I, I think uh, coming up with a digital strategy and, and, an ever evolving digital strategy is, is, is still very important on the land border and something that we're always looking to, uh, to improve upon. And is that something, Justin, that you've um, looked into taking part in any kind of advertising on uh, any kind of Google advertising, for example, when people are searching trips to the border? We are, we're present on, um, on Waze, Google Waze on the app when they're driving. So the, our little pin shows up. Um, the, the, the Canadian duty free industry has in the past done some, some marketing, um, you know, shown up on YouTube where we've done some targeted marketing, things like that, but it's, it's quite difficult because it's really someone driving a car at the last few minutes of their trip saying, Oh, there's a duty free shop here. I know what that is. And yes, I'm going to, cause it's, I'm really losing an opportunity not to buy something here because of the pricing, but how do I get that message into their heads? It's been a, it's been a real challenge. Well, that's what I'm wondering about whether if people are, are doing searching ahead of time where you're where you're taking advantage of the searches for trips or, you know, I'm going to say Google Maps. If people are looking at the best route to take from Montreal to New York or from Montreal to Florida, then then is there some way that you could target those people? The, the automatic Google Maps um, itinerary is not always our friend. It doesn't really, really work out that well all of the time. Uh, it's really where the geofencing comes in, where you're targeting a certain age group or someone looking at a certain subject where your advertisement or your product display or something, some kind of promotion or some kind of new thing where you're, you're throwing that into their, their scanning on their, on their social media. That's, that's really the only thing we've got right now. Okay, I'm going to go back to question two. Um, now, these days, activations are if not stopped completely they're they're not what they once were and tastings every it's a it's a new world where we're getting people to sample is is a challenge to say the least so what do you think spirits brands can do to um to work around this uh let's start with you john i i guess i don't have any you know earth shattering suggestions here you know, it's put in videos in the stores to explain your brand, have special packages, you know, to entice the consumer to pick you up. I don't think samplings are going to go away forever. I just think, you know, the presentation of how you sample will change or alter, whether that's giving a, a miniature away in the store or whatever, but it's it's just going to be very different for a while because everybody wants to be contactless. Do you think that, the, that there's a place for brand ambassadors in this? There's, I would say that it's gonna, more of the effort's gonna fall on the, the store operators to train their staff better, to educate the consumers if they have questions. I personally don't like somebody coming up to me trying to hard sell me on something. You know, if I have a question, I'd just like somebody to answer. So, um, but, if it's if the question is, are suppliers going to furnish brand ambassadors in the store? That's just another expense. Mm -hmm. If you 
You know, one of the things that I learned during COVID is a lot of our customers are really true partners and they worked with the suppliers and the, the operators work together. But there were some situations where the operators try to pass more of the delivery costs onto the supplier, longer receivables. You know, the, the foot traffic went down 90 to 95% in some airports and they still want to charge a full price for the, the light box. Mm-hmm. You know, so adding more costs to the supplier is not the solution here. Mm-hmm. Because, because guess, the supplier you. cannot... Honestly, I'm very serious when I say it's we're right at the fine line here, whether to continue in duty free or not, because we just cannot keep uh, lowering our costs to increase the duty free airport operators margin. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, the other thing is you have to be very careful because some operators shipped our product to places they weren't supposed to and created destabilization in domestic markets in an effort to raise cash during COVID. So on top of paying all these costs, then they're damaging the brand equity of some brands. You know, and then your wholesale, your distributors are upset because, hey, wait a minute, I have the exclusive right to sell in this market. Where's this product coming from? And, you know, they don't, then I become the policeman. So taking on more costs is, is, is not an option for me. Lewis, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to turn that over to you. What, what do you think uh, is the answer now that activations and tastings are curtailed? How can brands, we'll say cost effectively um, in light of what John has just said, cost effectively get their brands out whether that's a new launch for an existing brand or whether that's a brand itself trying to, to break into the market, what would be what would be a cost effective way to do that, do you think? Well, I'm going to slightly cheat the answer here and say there's going let's imagine a world where the metrics have changed. So cost effectiveness is now different. And we again we take the customer centric point of views like how on earth are we going to get people to stop and dwell and take it in? Super, I, I just have to interrupt you because I was going to say something before. For people, for brands, the customer is the store. So just let's just say make sure we say consumer or passenger. A passenger. Okay. How are we going to how are we going to get the passengers to stop and take an interest? I think that the, I, I agree with John, I think tasting will, will appear in, 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 a, in, a, in a kind of sanitary way, if you like. Uh, it's just a, re, a re-engineering of that process. So that will still happen. But I think as brands learn to get better at experiential, and we're seeing this a lot, a lot of investment from media and advertising is going to creating experiences. Uh, I love the example in the UK, for example, of Hendrix Gin, who've done some, you know, taken an ordinary bus shelter and created a, an experience of it. And, you know, they're not doing tastings, but they are using the other senses. They're using smell. They're pi- piping into the air around the bush shelter, the smell of cucumber and roses, which are part of the ingredients uh, of the botanicals in um, in their gin. So they're, they're engaging different senses, sound, smell, and so on. So, so brands can play around with uh, this ex- expectation that, that they should show up in an interesting way. Tasting is just an interesting way to show up. And it's obviously getting the liquid on the lips is kind of, golden in terms of converting you to 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 that product but i think there are other ways to convert people and 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 switch them on to your brand so the other senses for example i think there's also a great opportunity to show up in an an unexpected way in an unexpected place again the hendrix example is like showing up at an ordinary bus shelter an ordinary bus stop and transforming that ordinary moment in your day Uh, i love what um, feature furniture have done they're a big furniture manufacturer out of austria and they kind of created their own hold room experience at uh, Munich airport. It's all, so instead of rows of ordinary seats, they're really funky seats, nicely designed. You can work there comfortably, they're ergonomic. They do a better job of waiting and working and so on. So brands can show up like that. So I think there's, you know, being creative about how you get in front of your potential, um, um, uh, somebody who wants to be, you want to be, to join your brand, if you like, is going to be interesting. But I think that's the key. I think we have to move beyond a transaction mentality. Just selling something on the day is not good enough. That's, that's good, but it's not good enough. I think that you have to say, we want that person 
to become a fan of our brand. We want them to love our brand. We want them to know something about our brand. We want them to walk away with something that's not just an artifact, a bottle of stuff. We want them to go away with a kind of, God, that, that's a really cool brand. I learned something. I love the owner. I love the way the the way they make it. I, I love the way it came from. I, whatever it is, so many stories around there. So I think that, I think duty free generally and airports generally need to, uh, back to the metrics conversation, need to get their heads around the idea that just, you know, basing everything on, on volume of transaction is, is not the future. It really is not the future. And we need to enable a different form of engagement through uh, a re-engineering of the metric. Okay, Justin, what do you, what do you think about uh, tastings and activations and how how that will fit in the world? I think I think all of those are, are very important. Uh, the tastings happen a little bit less at the land border because people are driving in their cars. Um, so the, the, the activations are great, but at the end of the day, the, the really long lasting products are the ones that speak for themselves without a lot of arm waving. Uh, so I think the packaging is gonna be really important, something very simple uh, that, that, that the, the consumer understands very quickly. I think I think that's important. But those those really long lasting products, um, you know, uh, we've done pricing combos, we've done mix mix and match with certain brands, and that has traditionally worked. Uh, but when you're having a reduction in tastings and uh, maybe even in staff, uh, staff has been difficult to find lately. Uh, that packaging is going to be really important. Okay, um, just quickly for number five, uh, uh, duty-free travel retail exclusives. This is always something that's coming up. I know, I believe, John, you've done a couple of these things for Tito's. I'm not sure what you're feeling about it now since you're not, you're not keen on the whole duty-free industry at the moment at all. But what do you think is the place for this? Well, I, I think this has a, a very strong place in within the duty-free stores, you know, especially with the advent of all the different bourbons and rye finishes and the gin explosion in Europe. But for us, obviously we only make one type of Tito's. So our answer to this is we do, you know, different ugly sweaters for every holiday. And then the red, white, and blue bags, you know, during America's birthday celebration in July. So we'll continue down that road people get a kick out of the ugly sweaters. And do you find that that consumers are really in, are interested in collecting them, for example, giving them a oh, yeah, in a big way. And then they post pictures on the social media platforms. So it's been very successful. And I guess it's been so successful. We've seen a couple of brands copy our, our ugly sweater hmm. programs. Justin, you you probably see some of this at your. Yeah, store. I I certainly remember the ugly sweater uh, program that that was definitely popular. And it worked well, and I think that duty free exclusives, specifically for our customers heading to New York in the um, whiskey category, are, are very very important. Um, the opportunity to pick up a certain cask or a certain type of bottle that they can't find in the local market is is very appealing. Um, additionally to that, especially in the confection as well, we sell larger size chocolate bars and combo packs that's also um highly sought after but whenever there's a duty for exclusive we try to put a little sticker or something next to it to immediately kind of grab the uh you know the, the consumer's attention and, and that's been an important thing for us mm -hmm. okay lewis definitely yeah. i think this is a big one i think that uh, again back to the, the the passenger or the traveling consumer i mean they're they're interested in you know very often interested in giftability so what makes something giftable it's different and unique and and, and tells a story about where they've been. So, you know, Londonifying it or New Yorkifying something. There are many ways that something can be, you can take something quite ordinary and make it a little bit more extraordinary and therefore more giftable and different price points around that as well. So whether it's for gifting or self-consumption, I think there's a definite, definite um, strong role for uh, exclusivity. And, you know, obviously the obvious one is, 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 is taking price comparison out of it. How can you compare price like for like for something that's uh, that you're looking at in a store in, a, in an airport and you, you, you don't know where else to buy it from. So I think that that's um, a kind of bonus that uh, uh, an added value to to the kind of bottom line that we need to sort of uh, cash in on really. Okay, I'm going to go on to number six, and I will start with you, Justin. The, the question is kind of directed to you. Um, do you specialize in super premium? And look, I know you you have very high end wh whiskeys and cognacs, I believe that you that you market towards the New York customer. Um, I'm just wondering about how you market that 
market a, a, a luxury or exclusive, not exclusive, I'm sorry, a luxury, very expensive collector's item versus marketing regular, uh, regular priced spirit. So specific to alcohol, correct? Yes. Okay, so um, in, in our case, uh, we have a very, very close knit type of um, consumer driving to New York. And a lot of the time it's word of mouth. Someone will see it in the store and they're gonna call someone immediately. You know, hey, they've got this bottle here. And that's generally how we've been selling them. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, we, 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 you know, we tried, we've had a couple of bottles that you can't find anywhere else. We've had some Belvini 50s, some Glenfiddich 50s and those sell out fairly quickly. Uh, our inventory on the super premium, even during COVID is actually quite low. Uh, we do, uh, the, the store is open to non-essential traffic, but if you're a citizen or for example, if you have a business or something to get across the border, uh, you can still stop. And uh, we, ha we still have been selling that uh, during COVID. Not the, the major bottles, but um, ge generally the customers, they, they, they come in and they look around and they, they call their friends. Uh, and, and that's the fastest way to sell a bottle. So really the, the marketing is no marketing. The marketing is word of mouth. It's, it's word of mouth because you can't find it anywhere else. And, um, you know, it's also a showpiece because even if I bring something in and I, I hang on to it for a couple of months, it gets people talking and gets people excited. They, you know, they, they get excited about the price of the bottle. And so that's uh, something that helps sales uh, elsewhere in the store. It's a very different story for, for beauty, uh, but for alcohol uh, in that case, um, you know, it's not necessarily the price. It's more the exclusivity and not being able to find it anywhere. Okay. Lewis, you've worked on Johnny Walker houses. I, I, I believe that they have some pretty high end exclusive product. I keep saying the word exclusive. I don't mean to say the word exclusive high end products that are not available everywhere. Is there something specific that you do with design for, for that type of item? Yeah, I, th I think it's a combination of things that would appeal to, if you like, the connoisseur of that brand or the lover of that brand, um, and, and it, whether it's at a low price point or a high price point, actually. And I think that within travel retail, certainly within airports, you know, there's an expectation from the passenger that, you know, if they're going to engage with any brand, it should be, you know, something a bit special, something a bit different. Um, so I think there's a number of things that we would look at doing. Uh, the sales associates are a big part of it in terms of their knowledgeability, sense of passion and love for the brand. I think that needs to come through uh, in any conversation. Uh, you know, they've got to be more expert than potentially the person they're talking to about the brand. Uh, there's obviously an aesthetic to, to that and, and many brands will play to that. But I think that's an evolving thing. And we, we, we sort of rail against what we call luxury ghettos in airports or premium ghettos in airports because they're a big turn off. They sort of... Um, to some markets in, in more developing markets, I think luxury needs to look a certain way. But I think in other markets, it needs to feel a, a certain way about, you know, is it very creative? Uh, does it have an energy? Does it have a buzz? So you can put all of those things into it. So so luxury in that sense, or premium in that sense, is is needs to be really carefully looked at in terms of who, who your um, customer is in your airport at any one time. Um, and I think the product, obviously, the exclusivity comes into it. And this is where, you know, we, we package it all together, products, people, environment, um, the sense of, you know, that's, uh, as Justin was saying, you know, how rare is this thing that I'm being asked to look at? I think that's about the idea of not thinking about a customer or a consumer, if you like, or a passenger. It's about actually I'm talking to a fan. Premium, brand, premium brands have fans and they really need to play to that fandom people who love that brand and, and everything about it and are probably very engaged with it uh, throughout their lives or periods of their lives. Uh, and so I think therefore we need to be aware of that um, passion for the brand and we need to sort of drive up the experience in the environment, in the conversations, in the product exclusivity and the way it's presented and the different other types of experiences. And I love what Justin was saying about, and we call this kind of the hybridization of experience, put a Starbucks in the store. When is a shop not a shop? I mean, this is this is either thing about consumers, isn't it? We're, we're kind of like, we're shopping all the time. I could be sat in a Starbucks shopping um, and, and I could be ordering a coffee in a shop. So it's kind of like through an app and getting it delivered to the gate. So I think this idea of, you know, consumer behaviors are not sort of quite so siloed as they used to be. They're completely being blown apart. We're doing all sorts of things all at the same time. So I think that, you know, airport master plans, when they go, this is this is where we're going to put the food court, this is where we're going to put the duty free, this is where we're going to put the luxury, this is where you're going to sit and wait for a plane, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of that sort of uh, very old thinking. And we think that this merging and blending of all these activities that we know as people, um, that we're doing lots of things all at the same time. And we're not as siloed as, as perhaps this environment that we're walking through 
is expecting us to be you know so i think that you know uh, we can look at that as an opportunity to, to where we can cover off lots of things and do lots of things all at the same time without having to walk from one place to another place to do it all so i think that what is premium premium is about for us fundamentally premium is understanding what people want you know and i think that that's what airports need to get better at they need to get really close to people intimate with people that's what premium experience is about and they need to engineer the buildings engineer the journeys through those buildings talk to the right uh, concessions work with the right partners who can really get what it is that you know, the, these, these new ways these new mindsets these new behaviors that sh uh, sh uh, shoppers have if you like and that's what ultimately premium is we all we all appreciate that you know whether it's convenience we're looking for or whether it's uh, on the other end of the spectrum whether it's some kind of added value experience we're looking for we want brilliant convenience and that's premium uh, and we'll pay for that and we want brilliant experience and that's premium and we'll pay for that so airports need to decide whether whether they're going to do both or at the moment they get stuck in the middle they don't do convenience very well and they don't do experience very well and we just breeze through there going i can i can get better convenience somewhere else and i can get, get better experience somewhere else this isn't doing it for me so a premium is, 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 is premium thinking is a way to navigate through that conundrum okay justin you look like you wanted to add something there Oh, I was just going to add that John, um, Lewis was spot on with the fandom. That, that's that's very, very important with those specific bottles. Um, you know, they've got signatures on them from the, the seller master and some of our customers and specifically have told me that they've had a, you know, a tasting with the seller master and that they're invested in the brand. And and, and that is spot on what he was talking about. It's, it's become almost a uh, you know, a fascination for them to own a piece of that distillery. So those, those bottles with those high prices are very, very, you know, they're sought after by those types of uh, uh, consumers. And uh, John, I think that it's not a secret that there are, you have lots of fans. Tito's has lots of fans around the world engaging with your brand. Yes, it's, um, I have nothing to add to what Justin and Lewis have said because they're spot on. And yes, we have a lot of fans and we're very appreciative of those fans. And, and the, the, um, a lot of the fans come from the vodka, vodka for dog people program that we run. So a lot of people send us photos with their dogs and we sell dog items on our website and all the money goes to pet welfare charities. So. Um, I have written you. about that. Yeah, <laughs> our fans are great. And my dog used to have one of your little Tito's vodka bottles, but it's, yeah. that's long gone. <laughs> it, so, Justin, did they extend the, uh, the lockdown? Uh, just the current state of it right now is Canada will be accepting American travelers on August 9th. Uh, the current entry requirement is a PCR test 72 hours, 72 hours before entry or 72 hours before your scheduled flight as well as double vaccination and a test on arrival with no quarantine. The United States has not opened up at the current time. And I believe that's the same for several countries. So for example, an American can fly to Germany right now and Germany cannot fly to the United States is what I understand as of yesterday. And while we were yeah. doing the call, the America Center for Disease Control just said they are asking us not to go to Ireland, Greece and 20 other countries. Uh, yeah, I think there were 16 countries that came out yesterday that were, um, uh, you know, discouraged <clears throat> for American travelers. So I have to get a test before I get on the plane to go to Canada. And then when I get land, you're going to test me again. That's correct. The Canadian uh, verbiage is 72 hours prior to the scheduled airplane departure. And the American verbiage is three days before. So it's essentially the same, but they're just a little bit different in the, in the legality of it. Yeah. Can you do the rapid test or is it all the way up the nose test? PCR. I believe it's PCR, yeah. Wow. And when, when I uh, crossed the Canadian border from the US a couple of months ago, they had somebody, they didn't have somebody for me. I came, I arrived late in the evening, but they had a nurse right at the border who was doing the test right there. Because I arrived too late, I had to go online and show my ID to the camera do the test myself, have her time me and make sure that I stuck it far enough up there. And I had to, I, it, and I had to do that within the first couple of days of arrival. And then I had to do it again, I think 10 days later 
Yeah, a lot has changed and that keeps evolving. Um, but the, the, the current um, uh, regulation is 72 hours plus the test on site with no quarantine. Yeah, and there's no quarantine. When I, when I came, there was right. the quarantine too, but with the, with the double vaccination, there's no quarantine now. So oh, I've, I've been able to fly into your country this whole time, but, but not drive and I still can't drive into your country. And I'm, I'm assuming that I can still fly because I don't think that ever changed, but. You can, you can fly, yeah. yeah, but there's a lot of changes, you know, and that's something we've been trying uh, with the government to work on because um, if we can eliminate some of that PCR testing, you know, if you've got four kids in the car, mm. a thousand yeah. bucks. Well, it would be really nice if, if, uh, if the U.S. border, land border would open up to, to double vaxxed Canadians too, but... I'm sure you would appreciate that, Justin. I was I was actually um, getting a quote from Barbara about about that decision to extend that to August 21st, and I don't know. We'll see. I, I thought that I thought U.S. would open with Canada. I was really surprised that they didn't. I know that there are a lot of your border um, representatives are were really really pushing for Canada to open. I think that they were they were probably just caught completely off guard with the U.S. not opening. I'm surprised Canada went first. And there's a, you know, I, I think, uh, Louis, you're, you're in England right now. Is that correct? Because if, if you are an American, you fly from the U.S. to London, you can start walking around. If you're Canadian, there's a quarantine period. Even though Canadians had like 200 cases a day and the and U.S. Right. has like 53,000 yeah. cases a day. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty crazy. So, yeah, um, I'm just going to move on to the last question now. Uh, I'm going to start with you, John. What do you think needs to happen in the duty-free industry as a whole to improve spirit sales? And you can, and you can uh, take that to mean whatever you want, improve spirit sales. Well, I, I, I'm repeating myself, but it's all about going digital, having one app, you know, Orbits for travel, we need a duty-free app. I think that's what it's all about. People, I'm sure all of you have seen Drizzly is an app in the United States that connects liquor stores with consumers or vice versa. And there, the home delivery in the States exploded up like 400% during COVID. And Uber just purchased Drizzly because they want to access that market. But we need to, as an industry, and I'm not just speak, speaking spirits, this is all the categories need to be on this platform. And uh, we all need to embrace it. And I, we're, we're so far behind on this initiative. It's not even funny. I mean, I just, I just don't get it. I mean, when I give presentations at different organizations, I was in Oman just before COVID hit, talking about this. Everybody comes up and goes, you're hundred percent right, but nobody wants to take the bull by the horns. So that's why we're talking to this travel X dot AI group to see if we can tie in with them. Okay. That's all I got. Okay. Uh, Lewis. Yeah, I agree uh, with John. I think there needs to be some kind of streamlining of that whole digital world because there are too many platforms, too many, uh, duty free brands who are just not known to people and uh, have no ability to connect digitally. So basically they only, they only show up in people's in, in front of you when you're in the airport or whatever. So it's kind of like, you know, there needs to be a whole streamlining of that. Uh, and people are looking for that convenience, aren't they? So for people who want that, then yeah, that, there needs to be an easier way uh, rather than having to carry stuff around, uh, you know, why not get it delivered all that. So the whole engagement digitally, fulfillment digitally needs to be sorted out for that convenience uh, shopper. I think within stores themselves, I think again, at the risk of repeating ourselves, it's kind of it is it is about uh, shifting away from just set transaction transaction based experience. Um, you know, get the better balance between buying stuff and doing other things with your time uh, in in that moment. And I think then, if you're talking about airports specifically, I think that there's a need to sort of just uh, think about the the value of the passenger that, that most airports have in terms of the, who they are and that demographic and just, just to sell more to that kind of idea of recruiting a new customer to, your, to, to the brands and finding ways to, to not necessarily sell you something on the day, but to recruit people to the brands who are offering them these different experiences, whether they're in the stores or whether they're outside of the stores, uh, to say, actually, airports need to say, I can make money 
from selling my audience um, and not just selling the audience, but selling an audience that feels very positive in their sentiment to the experience they have with any particular airport, because it's about uh, good data uh, that, 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 that is personalized data that can create personalized relationships with. I love the example in Dubai of Le Clos, for example, the wine store who they create relationships with their, you know, a customer. You can talk to a sommelier in the store and then you can talk to that sommelier online through WhatsApp. Selfridges in the UK sell, pre-COVID, they sold um, £200,000 worth of, of goods to people through WhatsApp, through social media. That's because they've created a relationship with the customer. It's a, a personal shopper experience, if you like, but it could be a brand ambassador. It could be any kind of experience. It's migrating your you know, that passenger to a digital relationship and that's why to john's point i think that you know increasing sales just in the store you know we, we have to say the sales the sales pie needs to increase outside of the store as well as in the store um, and we can do that through these these different forms of engagement and digital is a perfect way to do that not just as a fulfillment platform but also a conversational as with the flow i can i can say well i would like to talk to sommelier about a great bottle of wine what have you got and it's a connoisseur kind of conversation, um, a more premium conversation. But nevertheless, it's something I'm, I'm already buying something before I even travel or being asked to think about things before I travel or being recommended things before I travel. So I think that that sort of uh, digital platform can be both a, a great fulfillment platform, but it can also be a, a relationship forming and building and maintaining platform. And I think that so if there is a platform to be made out there, it shouldn't just look at fulfillment. It should look at the, the bigger the bigger stories. Otherwise, brands will just go direct to consumer and create their own uh, platforms and will struggle with that because it becomes very fragmented for the consumer. Fans will navigate through that for sure, but others uh, will struggle to, to sort of discover those uh, uh, niche.com uh, venues to go to. So yeah, so lots of things that need to be done. And as John says, we've been talking about them for a long time and it's a bit frustrating that we seem to be um, roadblocked all the time and going nowhere. Mm -hmm. Well, duty free has always been a little bit behind the times. If, uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> if I'm allowed to say that, just Justin, um, and for you, what do you think will improve? Yours, you're looking a little less airports and more land land yeah. border stores. Well, well, but speaking what as, do you a, think? as as definitely speaking as a land border operator would be to increase the customs allowances. So currently they're um, a little bit restrictive. So it's one bottle per person duty free. And although the American duty, for example, is really not very high, it might be a couple of dollars. The customer is usually intimidated to buy the second bottle. Mm -hmm. They're about to cross, you know, they're about to cross customs. They don't really want to be stopped. They don't want to be searched or that's perhaps what's going through their mind. But if it was a, a more flexible customs allowance, I think that um, sales would definitely increase because it says it on the card, two bottles, I'll, I'll buy two bottles. I won't be buying one bottle today. So that's mm -hmm. something that would definitely help the industry out. Now, Justin, I, I, I'm not sure if this exists. So I, but if it doesn't exist, could it? Where if I were shopping in your store and I were allowed one bottle, I think it's 1.14 liters that I'm allowed to cross the border with. Um, and I wanted to, to order, I wanted to buy more than that. Would I be able to choose to pay the duty through your store? Yeah, absolutely. And, go, so and the, then uh, go to the border agent and say, look, I paid the duty on this. Yep. We have people that do that all the time. You can certainly buy. I, um, I'm not going to quote the, 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 the limit that you're allowed to bring because I'm not sure of the exact amount right now. I know that's uh, it's a, it's, it's in cases, but there's a certain amount that you're not allowed to cross the border with before you need a commercial license. Mm -hmm. But if you're buying one, two, three, 12 bottles, that's, you know, you just declare it as normal and pay the duty. And when you go through us customs, that duty is not very high at all. Uh, but, but I can pay it at your store, though, so I don't have to worry about. You, you'd be paying at the at the at the U.S. At U.S. Customs point of entry, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it. Unless anybody has anything to add. I was just going to say on the. Uh, we always find it interesting around bottle size as well. It's a very sort of mundane point, I suppose. But I think that there's a huge advantage to, you know, um, not just buying liter or something i know that the spirits industry has made great strides to, to do smaller bottle sizes sampling sizes and so on but i think i think that kind of recognition that you know you can try more with your allowance you can try more spirits and more brands if you've got uh, options continue to offer the options on smaller bottle sizes and i think for female consumers or different consumers who are worried about you know what does it look like when i carry my liter bottle of vodka around with me it's kind of a it's, it's a lot to drink but it might it might it might give the wrong impression about the kind of person I am so there's lots of interesting psychology around this but I think this 
I think there's just this ability to offer smaller, you know, for, for manufacturers, um, for, the, for the brands themselves to sort of really work hard in the travel channel to sort of say, yeah, people want to experiment, they want to trial. Uh, we want to appeal to female customers more. So smaller bottle sizes, sampling sizes, all that kind of stuff, you know, you can max out your allowance for sure uh, and feel like you're getting, you know, 10 flavors instead of one um, or 10, uh, 10 tries at something instead of one. So I think that's an, an interesting sort of um, option to offer. Okay. Anything you'd like to add, John? No, just going back to that, the duty-free app we're talking about, to mm -hmm. follow up on Lewis's point, it can't just be transactional. The app needs to be fun, social, and addictive. The mm -hmm. people want to come to it all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just putting products on a page. And I'm, I'm going to bring China into the discussion because I think that they've really got it figured out with WeChat where you've got uh, a so really social and um, transactional and brand. Everything is combined together and there's interaction with the brand and the consumer. You kind of have everything in one place and everybody uses it. Good point. Oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, I think that that level of convenience, and as, as John, you mentioned, yeah, it's like it's not just about, you know, how much is how much are they selling, how much can I buy it for? It's a whole world of experience, social, fun, different events, different programs, the inside track on stuff, the opportunity to win things, whatever, whatever, whatever. Lots of reasons to kind of you know, use the app, stay stay with the app, follow the app, um, rather than just look at the price comparison. So I think, I think, yeah, that's the kind of platform that I think that a traveling consumer would really sort of enjoy, you know, um, you know, something that is really engaging across a broad spectrum of interests. And, that, uh, and as you say, Wendy, I think there are interesting models for that out there um, that we should look at. And this is digitally, I'm just going to add one, one more thing. Um, John's talking about the digital environment being, being uh, engaging and which is exactly what you and your company is always talking about with the physical environment at an airport is being more engaging and having brand um, interest in brands brought because of the experience as opposed to because of a promotion. Okay, well, that's Thanks it. Thanks for setting this up, Wendy. What's that? Thanks for setting this up. Well, thank you guys so much for being part of it. This is my very, very first round table. So it well, definitely won't be my last. Watch this space. I may, I may invite you again. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, right. Thanks guys. Good to see you all. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.